Hello everyone, Marky Joe 1990 here, and today I'm going to teach you how to make a basic chapter in Fire Emblem Builder GBA. So first things first, you're going to want to download Effie Builder GBA. Now this may seem easy, but there's a couple extra steps than you would expect. Firstly, you want to go on Effie Universe, and you want to search for Effie Builder GBA. Effie Builder GBA is made by this wonderful man right here, 7743. Never met a man who had only numbers for a name. Guess his parents really liked math. Um, you scroll down a bit, and you want to click this link right here. Oh, snap, 559. That means that 559 people have clicked that link. Not necessarily downloaded it, mind you, but anyway. It takes you to a website full of moon symbols. You want to scroll down until you see the sacred item itself, if you build a GBA. Click it. That's going to take you to another screen, and it's like... Whoa, download details and all that stuff. All you want to do is just scroll down here and click this. And then it will thank you for downloading it. And then the download will appear here. I've already downloaded it, so I don't need to show that part. But basically, it's going to show up as a 7-zip file. I, if you don't know what a 7-zip file is, just uh, be sure to get the program needed to extract its 7-zip. And then you will be able to open the archive by you know right-clicking 7-zip and then extract files. Anyway. I also recommend that you put Effie Builder GBA into its own folder, like Effie Builder GBA tutorial, which I did here. Uh, give me a sec, I need to delete those for purposes. Um, so after you do that, you might also want to get Usenti, which is a graphics editing program, which will also be very helpful when you're editing graphics in Effie Builder GBA. And obviously you need the ROM of the Fire Emblem game you want to edit. Um, in almost all cases, you're going to want to go for FE8 because FE8 has the most documentation, has the most features implemented. Um, like, for example, in FE8, you can now have people have, you know, hacked it enough that you can have the capture mechanic in the game or you can have skills implemented. And FE Builder GBA has some of those features implemented into its uh, utility. Um, so. I'm not going to tell you how to get the ROM. You're going to have to get it yourself. You know, legal reasons and the shit. So anyway, Effie Builder GBA. Let's dive right into it. So when you first open this program, you're going to be met with this screen. Um, if you don't have, if it's the first time you're opening it, it's not going to have a last opened ROM. So what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to click this. And then you're going to have to find your ROM, which in this case would be in nearly the same directory. So EffieClean.GBA for me. And bam! Whoa, what is this? Well, this is the simple menu, as it's called. Uh, there is an advanced menu, and then there is a simple image menu. Uh, all of which, you know, just different means to an end. You're mostly going to be spending time in the advanced editors menu, because that's where all the good stuff is. But anyway. I'm going to stop the video here. We're going to... We're gonna, now that we're past the first part, now I can really get into the nitty-gritty so the next thing in our on our to-do list is how do we edit the map well first things first you go to the map editor and there you go there's the map itself if you want to resize it you can you know click resize and you can determine like how far left how far up right and down you want to resize the map uh, I'm not gonna mess with that simply because I like the map the way it is I love him just the way he is you can also zoom in so that you can see the map more clearly. There's undo, redo buttons. You can also import maps from file. Like if you have, if you use Tilead or Mappy or some other map creation program, you can import it into this. Uh, though, you know, I, I generally just, nowadays I just do it in here. Um, you can also, at the, at the top left, you can determine which chapter you're going to be editing the map of. Um, and this thing is, the this shows the main map and also the tile changes of the chapter. Since this chapter currently does not have any tile changes, all it has is the main map. There's also the tile set palette, which is kind of an incorrect name because not only does it change the palette, but you can also change the tile set itself. As you can see, it's now a complete mess, but this is sort of the town palette, or the village, as it's called. Anyway, we're going to go back to fields. This is the address. It doesn't really matter all that much. Don't don't worry about that. Um, so next up, we're going to just we're we're just gonna erase this map. 
I know I said I like the, the way it is, but for our purpose of the tutorial, I'm going to have to eradicate it. So, with this map, you're going to be, you know, messing around with tile changes. So, for this map, I'm just going to, you know, put tiles that would change. Now, when I say tile changes, I mean, like, when you visit this village, it has to close. If a bandit destroys it, it has to be a destroyed, become a destroyed village, as you can see down here. Um, that's what tile changes are. And if you want a, uh, you know, if you want your chapter to be nice and presentable, if you want certain things to happen in the chapter, you'll find that a lot of times you'll be reliant on tile changes in order to achieve those results. All right, so we have that. And you know what? Just for the heck of it, a treasure chest. And of course, we also need a snag that we can destroy in order to create a bridge, you know, just in case that's what you want to do. It's worth noting that if you want to uh, grab a specific tile uh, from the map, you can right-click, and there you go. You can just click it, and that that's what makes the magic happen. Um, now, is there anything else I need to do here? Well, you know what? Let's throw in an arena. Oddly enough, okay, so most of these things that I'm showing on the map are things you have to program. Like, for example, you need to program the chest to be opened and to give you an item. You need to program the snag to create a bridge after you've destroyed it. Um, for some reason, the arena is not something you have to program. The game is just like, oh, that's an arena. Well, all right, guess, the, guess we could just program that without your permission. Um, but yeah, I think that's all we need to do for this particular map. Um, next, we're going to want to do some tile changes. So let's click the... Uh, ed, ed, Let's click the added tile changes one. And as you can see, it kind of just moved it up to here. Like everything's grayed out except for this thing up here. Um, so the way the tile changes work is that you want your tile changes to be ordered from top to bottom, left to right. So for example, this village should be the first tile change you take care of. And then it should be followed by the treasure chest because it's higher than the snag. Um, and then finally the snag should be taken care of. Um, so as you can see, it's only the, the tile change itself is only the size of one block. You can change that by going into resize. So we're going to make it go down like that. And there we go. So this is our first tile change. We're just going to do that. Awesome. Now we need to add another tile change though. We need to add the tile change where the village is saved. Oh, snap. So... Again, it's in the top left. We need to kind of move it. Uh, so if you hover your mouse over a specific tile, you'll see that down here it tells you the coordinates that you're hovered over. So this is 1, 2. We want our tile chains to be at 1, 2 because that's, you know, th that's where the door closing thing is. And there you go. You just go to resize, you reposition it, and then bam, you're ready. And you just put it right there, bam, right to ROM. And there you go. That nonsense is finished. And, alright, so... Now we need to take care of this one. So that's at 13-7. 13-7. Bam! That chest is opened! And lastly, the snag. I hope you get the point by now. Um, so that's at 6-8. Now, this one's a little tricky because this is... You know, kind of a weird size. So we also want to make sure that it extends over two, over two tiles after we set the position. Because, again, it only starts at one tile in size. Now, I believe the correct tiles would be this. Uh, this. Oh, that doesn't look right. Well, whatever. It doesn't matter. It doesn't need to look perfect. Either way, you can clearly see that it's what it is. And, okay, so, now our tile changes are done. Now we need to figure out how to, like, there's more to it than that. We need to also figure some other stuff out. Um, like, once you finish all these tile changes, you need to pay attention to this address. Because in the event condition menu, oh, sorry, not the event condition, the tile changes menu, you now have to, oh, wait, I think it, Oh, snap, it does it for me. That's actually nice and convenient. 
Well, okay, that works out. So, now that we've done part one of, you know, programming all these tiles and stuff, now we need to get to part two, which is programming the other tiles. For example, we, need, we still need to program this village to be visitable. Um, and we need to program this castle to be seizable. We need to program this chest to be opened. We need to program these armories and vendors to be, you know, and this house to be visitable. We don't need to program that arena to be visitable because it just kind of by default is. So next up on our list is programming those very things. So we go to event condition. We got to go to our nice little chapter, event type map objects. All right. So as you can see, the prologue doesn't have any of that because it doesn't normally have any of that. So let's see. Let's count how many events we need to have. Well, we need one for the village being visited and one for it being destroyed. We need one for this. So that's one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. So we need seven in total. So since there's none here, we have to add some. We got to go to extended list. We got to set the total number of data to secure. It's going to be seven because that's how much we need. And there we go. So now is the lovely part of, um, you know, programming this stuff. So this is the first, you know, uh, map object event. We're going to want to set it to uh, visit village. Bam. Oh, whoops. We have to click the coordinate and then it'll point it out. So we might also want to set an achievement flag for the village, but it doesn't really matter. Uh, we'll get into achievement flags later on. Um, now, when you visit the village, nothing is going to happen because no event is set to happen. So I'm just going to set something very simple. All right. So click new event. It's like, do you want to newly allocate the area of the event instruction? Odd kind of way to word it. But once you hit yes, it's like, all right, let's do that. So this is the event editor of the um, of FE Builder GBA. It's very different from the event assembler mef method, at least in terms of presentation and whatnot. You're not doing it in Notepad. But basically, when you want to add a new event, you got to click whatever's there and hit insert, and then it'll make it happen. And then... With that new event, you want to go, you want to double click it and then hit command. And in this case, all we want to do is just give an item to whoever visited the village. So in this case, get item by visited unit or get money. You know, it works either way. So we're just going to give it something basic. You can designate the item by hitting the up and, up and down arrow keys or you can use this and so on and so forth. Or alternatively, you can just click item and it shows you the whole item list and you know what? Fuck it. Let's give it a rune sword. Change it. Bam. And there you go. That's our entire event. It just gives you a rune sword. There's nothing, there's nothing special happening. There's no cutscene. We'll get into cutscenes later. Uh, I have data that I have not written in. Can I close the form? No. Wait, what the? All right. Well, it seems to be working, so I ain't complaining. Um, now, there's more to this than we ha than what I just did, though. You're not done yet with programming this village. You have to set the type. So I think for this scenario, you want to set it to home. Let me just check just to make sure. Yeah, you got to set villages to home for some reason. Oh, snap. Uh, oops. Sometimes you'll forget that um if you builder when you haven't assigned the other things it'll just assume that the other map objects don't exist and so you'll have to remember how much you implemented set the count to that number and then reload rom important stuff to know so i think our village is pretty much working however we also need to set an event for when the village is destroyed and i think uh caesar vi visit home okay so I need to set it to that. Seize or visit home. And I, this is a little bit unintuitive, but you want it to be in the center of the village. I don't know why, but there you go. And then you just set this to village center. Oh, it's out of range. Cannot be. If you write outside, there's a danger of destroying the ROM. So just set the. Please use extend the list button. No, that. Okay, yeah. It's panicking because it forgot that I used the extended lists uh, earlier. But this is all an extended list, so it's okay. 
And it won't let me do it. Oh, wow. That's kind of lovely. All right. Well, uh, I guess we're just going to have to set another extended list then. That's a bummer. All right. Well, either way, let's just get to fixing this. The, the good thing is that you guys are also learning how to get out of these scrapes that I'm getting myself in. Um, okay, so I think that's set, pretty much. Alright, so next is the house. Um, so this is a visit home. Achievement flag, event. Well, we're gonna have to create an event, some kind of event. So, you know what? You guys get to see me make an event then. Alright, so head to the events. And when you visit the house, the event that's here will play. So, we're just gonna have to... We're just gonna make some random conversation happen. Um... That one, and, you know, there's a whole array of just conversations that we can have. Um, I'm going to skip over to where... Actually, there's a search function. So, if you know a certain dialogue in the game and you want to replace it... Um, I don't. You, but you can do that. Just bear in mind that it's kind of reading it as code rather like you can't just type in whatever and assume that the game will know what you're talking about because it also factors in like codes like oh press the a button to advance the text and so on and so forth so let's just skip ahead blocked dang it where is that fall of renee's dialogue and this is it. This is the very first piece of cutscene dialogue in the game. Your Majesty, I bear bad news. The castle gate's been breached. Okay, so we're just going to change this to um, some random villager t saying some shit to us. Uh, so there's the simple way of doing this, which I find kind of annoying to use. And then there's the source text, which shows you all the codes that are used during the dialogue. Now, as you can see, it's using like at 009. We don't have to deal with that. What we can do instead, firstly, we're just going to change that dialogue so that I can get to it later, is that there is an option in FE Builder that allows you to set it to um, the familiar language of FE Editor. So if you've ever used Fire Emblem Editor before, then this should be familiar to you. You can set the text escape notation to Fire Emblem Editor. And so let's just go back to that dialogue and bam, that's a little bit easier to read. So, okay. Next up, we have to set what happens when you visit this place. So, uh, with Fire Emblem Editor's dialogue, basically if you want a dude to show up in the open mid, uh, the mid right section of the screen, you got to do this. Um, I believe that makes, yep, that makes the weird person show up. And there's Erica. Okay, so I guess when you visit this house, Erica will speak to you. Which will be weird because the character we're going to have is Erica. <laughs> Who's going to be visiting it. And I believe this is for, yeah, okay. So, when you're visiting a house, you have to designate who the visited character is in the conversation. So, open, mid, left, load, face. And this will basically display the portrait of the character that visited. 0x, FFFF. In all other instances, when you want to des designate a specific character, you want to go open somewhere, load, face, 0x, 1, and then the portrait. Um, it's, it's slightly different from how the original e Fire Emblem editor did it, but it gets the job done. Anyway. So, the last person you opened with, like, the last open you did, open mid-right, is going to be the person talking. So, in this case, Erica is going to be talking. Uh, hello. Whatever. That's, that's it. I'm just going to have that. Uh, so, hello. And this thing right here is just, oh, press the A button to advance the text. We're going to have the visiting person say something. Uh, but not only that, we're going to make him do a little hop. <laughs> so basically, if you move, you can move a character into various positions on the in the cutscene. Um, but if you move them into the same spot that they're already at, they'll just do a little bounce. Yay! And now, just for the hell of it, 
I'll have the person on the right switch places with the person on the left. So if you move, like, as I said before, somebody you open with, if they move into a different spot they're already at, they're just going to move there. But if you move them into the position of another character, then they'll switch places. However, bear in mind that once you move a, a character, you have to then open a word bubble in their new location. Because if you just... If you don't have open mid left after move mid left, then the dialog box is going to show up still at like their previous location. So what what would happen theoretically in this spot is that you know um, our visiting character would switch places with Erica, and then Erica would say something after this, which would be confusing. So open mid left and dupe. So there we go. So this will happen um, when you first use Fire Emblem at, uh, Builder GBA. Is that it'll be like, uh, character's not registered in the system. All you really need to do is just hit method two. Anti-Huffman, apply to patch, bam, done. Easy as pie. And look. Oh, wait, it's making Erica speak? Uh, open mid left, yay. Open mid right. Uh, it's, it's just, oh, oh yeah okay my bad <laughs> yeah I made a little mistake there um Erica moved to the mid uh, to the mid left and then it goes to her and she says dupe so that's it um I'd like to show this working in action but we'll have to get into that later in any case we now have our dialogue for when you visit the house right to Rom. And bam, our little conversation's there. Okay, so when you visit, oh, wait, we forgot to designate the house. Bam, there we go. Now it works properly. Caesar visit home, home, and I think all this, the rest of this stuff is good. Um, next is the vi the shop. So you just go to shop, achievement flag, items sold. So here you can click item sold and it'll allow you to create new shop data I don't feel like doing that right now but I guess I'll do it fuck it we allocated new space and it, I guess that's just the base inventory that it has all right so I mean whatever so what you're gonna want to do is you're more gonna want to take the address oh it already does that <laughs> never mind so yeah, basically you just click items sold and these are the things you can do. If you want to add more stuff to the shop, you go to extended list and then you designate the number, which is kind of annoying. If you want there to be less items in the shop, then you just hit zero and then it will do that. Exactly that. Uh, but you have to, like there has to be at least one item where there's just nothing. So since I deleted the silver sword and replaced it with nothing... When we reopen this, it's just going to have these things. Um, okay, so shop types. This is the vendor, I believe, right? Uh, so you know what? It doesn't make sense that I have um, iron swords and, and whatnot in here. So let's... All right, I guess we'll make it a lockpick. Door key, sure. Oh, I forgot to write to ROM. I, I kind of want there to be a vulnerary in here. Oh, there it is. <laughs> All right, so there we go. Now we've designated the shop, and we got to set the coordinates because, again, since we... It's worth noting that when you extend the list, basically it, ex it makes a whole bunch of new stuff by copying the first thing that's here. That's why e every new extended, you know, item here just automatically is here at the village because that's what the first event I programmed is. All right, so armories are basically the same thing as a uh, shop. So you just go to shop, armory, set the coordinates, and then you make new shop data. And bam. And we're just going to leave this alone because it's got swords anyway. I don't give a crap. And let's see. So next up is our good old seize point. Bam. Seize point. Seize. And I think basically what I want this to do is just go to the ending event. 
Um, so we'll worry about that in a second. Oh, we got to set, set it to the proper cease point. I'll show you how to make it go to the ending event in a second. Unless you want to make your own custom event, then you just hit new event and then you make it from there. But I don't feel like doing that right now. Um, eh, fuck it. We'll just... I'll just show you a basic event that takes you to the next chapter. So, command... Uh, I don't know exactly where it is, so we're just gonna go to show all, type in the search, go to next chapter without world map. Yeah, because I don't want a world map, screw that noise. And you just designate what chapter it goes to next. There we go. And that's our ending event. Why does it keep giving me that error message? It doesn't seem to affect anything. But yeah, basically once you seize, it'll just take it to the next chapter. Nothing special. And lastly, we just need to program the chest. So we just go to chest. We go to chest contents. Achievement flag, chest contents. And it, by clicking chest contents here, you can, it'll take it to the item menu where you can designate whatever the heck you want in there. And I think that's it. So, I'd like to show all this stuff working, but unfortunately, I have to make characters show up on the map in order for that to even work. Uh, and we haven't quite gotten to that, have we? Uh, just give me a second. Okay, so our next course of action is we're going to want to mess with the opening cutscene of this game so that we can make our characters show up on the map. So... All you need to do is, in the event condition screen, go to the, your chapter, and then click this menu, go to chapter start event. Now, this is the entire prologue event, like the opening cutscene in uh, Fire Emblem 8. It does not include the part where it talks about, oh, where it has the, like, the text on the screen, just on a black background, being all like, oh, the sacred stones and stuff. That is something you can remove in the patch area, I believe. I am not entirely sure. But I know it's something that's removable. But this is the opening cutscene of the game. We're just going to delete all this crap because we don't need any of this. <laughs> Are you kidding me? Okay, so. We're going to get our first, like, serious business opening cutscene. Except all I'm going to do is make units load. Um, so we're going to insert events. We're going to go to the command thing. Unit placer. Load units, uh, I think the one you want to use is this one or this one. I think, oh, okay, so load units and move if player unit join your party. So basically what this does is it, is it loads the unit and it waits for them to move. Um, that might seem weird at first, but you know how when reinforcements spawn on a map and like they move, they pop up and then move for a little bit and then stop? Uh, that's what this is referring to. This, on the other hand, it'll just load the units, and even if they're still moving, the rest of your events will continue to go. So, you're going to want to pick this one. And you're going to have to designate the units. You're going to have to set the address. Um, but, what you can do is you can click units. You can allocate new space. Uh, or not. Well, what you could do is, you see this whole, like, Erica loading sh debacle? Uh, you could just take the address here and just, you know, copy-paste it into here. You press enter, and then there you go. It shows you how that works. Or, alternatively, you could just load, you, you know, allocate new space. This is the unit placer, by the way. I should probably mention that. Um, allocate new space. You, you can set the number of units you want to have show up. I think I'm going to just have Erica, and that's it. So, uh, yeah, this is the unit placer. So, I can set wherever I want her to be. Um, alternatively, I can have her do a thing. Wow, this... I hate the unit placer simply because it's such a big, obnoxious thing. But, okay, you can set where she loads. You can also set where she goes after loading. So, let's see. After moving, list extension. We could set it to just one new area. 
And there we go. Okay, so pre-placement. This is her starting coordinate when she spawns. And then you can set her after showing up where she shows up. So, for example, this right here, if, like, basically when I load this, she'll pop up here and then walk here. And then the chapter will start. Um, however, she doesn't have any equipment. She also doesn't hasn't had her class de designated, among several other things. So we're going to do that, shall we? So unit number is Erica. That's fine. We're going to set her to class number two, which is the Erica Lord. And her commander is going to be uh, her. <laughs> then you want to set her level. We're going to make her level one. She's a player unit. She's uh, Her auto level is unit dependent. This is kind of weird, all right? So basically enemies, um, their stats are... The way that enemy stats are generated is that they have a specific character slot. Like Erica is character slot number one. Um, like this is a generic soldier, A to B. Like they have a, a designated character slot. It takes their level and whatever level you set here, if you set their auto level to class dependent, basically if they're level five, but their character data says they're, they're level one, they'll level up four times to accommodate and their stats will uh, be increased as a result. If you set this to unit dependent, then it doesn't affect their stats at all as far as I'm concerned. I think the class, the character growths are taken into account, but if it's class dependent, it uses class growths instead. Um, but I I don't think that's the case at all. Anytime I've used this, unit dependent just takes their base stats and just that's it, regardless of their level. Anyway, so Erica's on the map. She's level one, she's player, she's unit dependent. It's worth noting that anytime you change the level or whatever. Like, if you set them to enemy and then you change their level, it just changes back to player for some reason, which is kind of a weird thing. Hopefully, it'll be fixed in the future and this tutorial will be irrelevant. Oops. So, you might have noticed that Erica suddenly is set to move over here. That's because I forgot to... Um, I have... Like, this is her afterwards coordinates. You have to click right coordinates after and then it'll be okay uh, after you click this. See? It stayed consistent this time. Um, this is the AI section. You're not going to worry about this for now. But it, it's pretty self-explanatory. And most of the stuff, like, if there's specific things about the AI you want to edit, like what character to move towards or to avoid, I think that the advanced editor section allows you to do that. Yeah, like AI, target AI. So there is a way to mess with that. So we, got, we need to set her equipment. So let's just make it an iron sword and a vulnerary. Now, I obviously know the idea of the vulnerary because I saw it before. But if you don't, that's fine. You could just click item 2 and then the menu will come up. And then you just double click it and there you go. Bam! So Erica's got an iron sword and a vulnerary. I think that's it. Now, it's worth noting you need to copy this address now. And you need to put it into your events. And as you can see, it works. Now, I think now our chapter is ready to be uh, play tested. All right, so we're going to speed this up. We're going to go to difficult. And as I said, it has this opening cutscene. Uh, and it still has the world map events. You can remove that if you want to. But we'll get into that later. So fall of Renee's. And there we go. Hold on. Oh, she just kind of shows up in that spot already. Huh, strange. All right. Either way, let's just test our, you know, test to make sure these work. All right, so I got a rune sword. Awesome. Sweet. And it closed as I anticipated. <laughs> well, there's our, there's our fucking visiting cutscene. And as expected, so that's working. And this is working as anticipated as well. And if you want, if you're freaking suicidal, you can enter the arena. Oh, wait, I don't, I don't have any money. Oh, that's pretty funny. All right, let's just beat the hell out of this snag just to make sure the eventing for it works properly. Yep, it does. A little bit of map error there, but whatever. And I can't open this chest, so 
I'll just have to give Erica a chest key. And bam! Look at that! It all works according to plan! Okay. Oh, what the heck? What is this? Oh, wow. Sometimes this program acts weird. Um, so what else is there to do? Well, we o we did the op the opening event. We did the ending event. Um, we don't need to worry about the map for now. Simple menu, advanced editors, this, that. Well, we probably should give Erica some enemies to fight. Also a chest key. There we go. Good old chest key. Um, so I believe the reason why Erica, like, when she loaded onto the map, she was already in the spot that she was set to go to. I think the reason behind that is because in the chapter editor, um, dark before initial event. Yeah, so this thing right here is important. Like, it starts out black, and then, like, because my event says to return, it kind of brings the the uh, game to fade in, like the map fades in. But if you set it to fade to map, then it'll already be into the map and then you'll be able to witness Erica showing up. Oh, whoops, wrong chapter. <laughs> All right, here we go. Yep, there we go. See, just as planned. So, um, We've, we have a seize event that's going on, but what if we want the, the objective of the chapter to be to defeat the boss? Well, let's add some enemies, shall we? Okay, so... How do we make a map where the objective is to defeat the boss? Well, first things first, we need an actual boss to fight. Uh, let me just refresh this. Yep, chapter start event. There we go. Okay, so... We need a boss to fight. Let's just have one singular enemy... And you guys have seen me do this already. We're not going to use the whole after moving, after placement thing. We're just going to have them pop up on the map and that's it. I don't care. Now, you can set the unit number. Scroll down. Let's just make it O'Neill. Make it nice and simple. I don't know where O'Neill is. <laughs> I am so There we go. 68 O'Neill. Right to Rom, or wait, it didn't set it to him for some reason. Right now, he's a player unit. We're going to set him to an enemy. Oh, but see, it set it back to player again. Remember that. It, it acts weird. He also wants to set the class. Uh, well, we'll make him in a class that Erica can easily defeat. So, like, Brigand, maybe. Oh, wait. <laughs> Let's make him a journeyman. <laughs> oh, oh, that's so mean. <laughs> and of course, the iron axe, which is one F. Uh, everything, everything seems to be set. His AI. Let's see. Well, chance of action. Um, I think that's like they'll move and attack. You'll have to mess around with these yourself. But I'm a little uncertain about some of these. So you can set them to not move. I think that's specifically like. Do not move unless they're in range. And recovery mode. Now, this is interesting. So, recovery mode is when it is basically a mode where the enemy, instead of trying to attack you, is going to find ways to heal himself. So, if there's forts, he'll flee to the forts. If there's a healer, he'll run towards the healer. Um, you can set it so that there is no recovery mode for this character. So, they'll just keep coming after you despite being low in health. So you can actually do some interesting strategies with this. Like, for example, you can make it so that if they get hurt even the slightest, they'll, they'll you know, want to be healed. Now, it's also worth noting that um, healers will not heal somebody unless they're in recovery mode. Um, so, like, if you want the enemy to constantly be healed or, or for the healers to be especially aggressive about healing, you definitely want to go... For eight, recovery mode when HP is 80% or less. Um, now it's worth noting that it, there is a downside because the enemy is more likely to run away if 
if they're low in health, but if you don't have any forts, they don't have anything to run to, and so the healers will just have a field day with them as they just relentlessly attack you. So it's good if you're trying to make um, a map where enemy phases highly advantages for the enemy instead of for the player. Evacuation AI. Um, I don't know how that works. Uh, I think it's basically like if they're in recovery mode... Uh, they'll run away, but if you set it to do not take evacuation behavior, they'll just stay in place. They, they'll they still be in recovery mode, which means that they'll use things like uh, vulnerabilities or elixirs to heal themselves instead of attacking, and also um, healers will still target them, but they just won't move or try to run away as they do it. All right, so there's our boss. But we also need to... Uh, there's more to it than that, Like, because if you if you just kill the boss, he's it's not going to end the chapter. Um, we need to set things such that when the boss is killed, or rather when he triggers his defeat quote, that the chapter will finally end. So, let's jump to dialogue when defeated. Now, he already has some dialogue when he's defeated. So, I'm just going to explain what this is, alright? So, this is just a list of death quotes throughout the entire game. Your units, the enemy units, so on and so forth. Some... Characters have specific death quotes on specific chapters. Uh, for example, Ford has one that plays specifically on Chapter 5X, which is, you know, the the Prince Ephraim chapter that everybody hates. Um, but generally speaking, you're not going to be too worried about that because most characters are going to have a death quote on any chapter. Um, I believe these are also prioritized based on what comes first. Like, for example, Ford... Um, his death quote for chapter 5X will trigger and take priority over his death quote for any chapter. Let me just find it. Yeah, he has one for any chapter. But since this one is placed higher in the priority list, his death quote for 5X, the game will first check if he has a death quote for 5X. And that will trigger. If you set his uh, any chapter death quote to be above this he would say that every single time and this would be totally meaningless so that's important you need to prioritize based on that um but anyway o'neill so this you designate what unit is gonna have a death quote i don't know what the heck this is every dude seems to have it so i guess it's important i don't know I mean, just for safety, I guess you should just set it to FF or just nothing. I'm not entirely sure. You'll have to figure it out through trial and error. Um, here you can set their chapter ID where they use it. If you set it to FF, that's any. But we want it to happen only on the fall of Renee's. And the achievement flag, this is important. Basically, once this quote triggers, this flag will be set. This will be like, oh, confirmed this flag. This is not necessarily the defeat fo boss flag. You can set this to whatever you want. And it doesn't matter. You, any flag will work. But generally speaking, the original game uses achievement flag 2 for defeat boss. Which is why 7743, uh, you know, he labeled it as the defeat boss flag. Additionally, there will be some text that the boss will say when they're defeated. In this case, O'Neill will just go like, what? How? So there you go. So... Oh, it even explains down here that normally flag 0x02 zero zero is normally used. Um, so anyway, we're not going to fuck with this. We're just going to leave it as it is. We're going to write to ROM because I don't know. <laughs> but, okay. So, that's not enough, though. We have to do a little bit more. We have to make the game check for when that event, uh, for that achievement flag, when it happens. So, we're going to go into event conditions. We're going to go follow our nays. Always condition. Now, always conditions have various things you could do in it. Always conditions are basically conditions that are achieved when a specific flag goes off. Uh, right here. Ju okay, so the judgment flag. This is the ID that triggers this cutscene. So right here, this is the chapter end event. Notice that the judgment flag is two. That's when you defeat O'Neill because that's when his death quote happens. Um... And his death quote is what triggers the this achievement flag. So basically what this is saying is that when O'Neill is defeated, trigger this event, 
which is the chapter end event. And this is just a, a normal flag. Um, so, how do I explain this? For a lot of events, you're going to want to set some kind of achievement flag, but only if you want it to happen once. There's several other things you could do uh, to mess around with this whole concept, but basically, um, when certain events happen, you could set it to turn an achievement flag on, and so any other event that is supposed to use that event flag will not happen. So, like, for example, let's say that you killed O'Neill. And there's like a event on turn eight that checks to see um, if he's that like can only happen if event ID two is not triggered yet. So basically, by defeating O'Neill, you prevent some other cutscene from happening. And at the same time, if that cutscene happens and O'Neill's not dead, his death quote won't trigger because they share the same ID. And so, if it's already used, then the game won't have his death quote happen or any other cutscene for that matter happen um i think i'm getting a little too in detail in detail with this what you guys all you guys need to know is that if you want a boss to be defeated you know if you want that to end the chapter you just need to ha set an always condition with a judgment flag of the boss's death quote so just to show you this shit in action let's let's rock and roll all right, I don't know if Eric is strong enough to beat this guy. Oh, he didn't show up. Well then, I know exactly why. Because while I did create a unit, you know, so unit data for him, I did not load it. And that's important. See, I need to go back to my starting cutscene, and I need to, you know, make one for him. There we go. See, now he loads and moves. And then we hit F5 to load the game. Skip all this shit. And bam! There he is! O'Neal! Oh god, he's fast. Uh... Erica. <laughs> oh shoot, you might be in danger. Why is he so strong? Holy cow! What the fuck? You know what? Uh... Let's... let's Let's nerf him a little bit. What level is he anyway? He's just level one. This is unit dependent. What are the bases of the journeyman stats? It's worth noting that the base stats of your character are determined by your character bases, which are shown here. So he's got all those. He's got his two skill. And your class bases. So he had two skill there. This class has five skill. So that so by simple math, that means that his Skill stat will be 7. Lo and behold, I was correct. I'm a freaking prophet. Alright, so I did not realize this. The journeyman actually has uh, pretty high bases for some reason. Like, those are nothing to shake a stick at. So we're just going to use his normal class then. Because I don't want to deal with this crap. I think the reason why journeyman has such high bases there is because... Um, Ross, who is the only journeyman in the game... Uh, I don't think his base stats... I think his base stats... His character base stats are all zero. Uh, which is pretty funny. Is that a commentary on how bad Ross is? And he's just being carried by his class? Alright, anyway. Yeah, oh, those are much more reasonable. Alright, so now that we've designated that to be the proper class for him... Let's restart the chapter, blah 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 blah. And there we go. Th that's a lot more workable. He has only 20-something HP. Oh. And that's just a turn event that happens. I, I need to just remove that. It's no big... What the fuck? Alright, so we've got a problem here. Mayday. Okay, so I suspect the reason why it crashed there is because of this event here. The always condition. Um, so, if you remember in Fire Emblem 8's prologue, when you defeat the first two enemies um, of the map that aren't the boss... The cursor flashes on Seth and says all that's left is their leader. I suspect the reason why this is going on is because of this event right here. Because Seth is not on the map. So the game's having a fucking hernia over it, you know? So let's just set this to Erica, And uh, let's see what happens, shall we? Of course, we could also just remove the event outright, but... 
Yep, there we go, see? Yeah, so uh, if you try to flash the cursor on a character that's not on the map, then it'll have a freak out like that. And Erica's gonna die. Oh, but she didn't. There we go. Uh, is this still recording? Okay, good, good. All right, so now we're gonna trigger the boss defeat quote. And the chapter's gonna end. And there we go. So you might have noticed, like, it's gonna go to... Sorry. In the always condition, it's going to go to this event here. Now, if you want this to go to the chapter end event, all you need to do is go to chapter end event, click this. See this address right here? Copy. Screw that noise. Always condition. And then just copy paste it here. And there we go. So, okay. So, we have mostly a functioning chapter. I guess I could go into turn conditions. We'll get into that in a bit, actually. You know what? Uh, I'll be right back. Okay, so before I get into turn events, let me just do one other thing. If you want to, uh, if you want the chapter to end after all the enemies are defeated and not just the boss, all you need to do is set the judgment flag to six. Flag number six and flag number four are both very important, like very, uh, special flags. Number six will automatically go off when there are no enemies on the map. Um, so basically you can just have an event that checks judgment flag number six. And basically what that means is once all the enemies are gone, execute this event. So in this case, it executes the chapter end event once all the enemies are gone. Uh, now judgment flag number four is the second BGM flag. Basically, if you turn flag number four on, then it will change the music based on what you set in the chapter editor. So for example, we're in the Fall of Renee's and the normal music that plays is player phase BGM, Distant Roads. Oh, I didn't set my sappy thing. You're gonna want sappy uh, referenced in FE Builder as well. I should probably mention that. Um, but if you set, if you turn on event ID, uh, sorry, flag number four, it will play the second background music so here it's just set the distant roads but for example if you want something really cool to happen like it starts with distant roads but then the chapter gets serious you could turn like a whole bunch of reinforcements come in and another boss shows up you could turn event flag number four on and that will change the music to, uh, for the player phase to rise above so like you have all these dudes show up and then the music changes it's it's like oh things got more serious but anyway, I just want to briefly touch on that. Um, let's touch on turn conditions. Now, turn conditions are pretty simple. Basically, all it is is um, you set a flag. It could be zero, which is something that you can... Basically, that means that the turn event will happen anytime that it fulfills the start turn and end turn conditions. Um, if you do set it to an achievement flag and it's supposed to happen multiple turns, basically it'll, it'll happen only once because the second and third time and so on that it happens because the event, the achievement flag that it needs, it has been used. It just doesn't run the event anymore. Now this could be interesting because, um, you can have a turn event that has an achievement flag, like you could set this to eight, and you could have an event that like checks if certain things have happened, and if not, you can set it to turn the the flag off again, so that the turn condition will happen again until finally the conditions are met. Which, by the way, if you want to turn a flag on or off, this is how you do it. You just flag, and then you just designate what it is. Um, event, this is self-explanatory. This is just the address to the events. You could just click this and it's just tutorial shit. The start turn. Now, basically when you're, um, if you go into the game and you go into the status menu, you could see what turn it is. So right now it's turn one. So basically this event runs on turn one and that's it. What is this? It's just tutorial shit. So if I played this on easy mode, 
um, then some tutorial events probably would have happened. Uh, and then the end turn, basically, if you set this to like two or three or any number, it's going to happen once that turn starts. Once it reads like that specific turn on the status menu. Um, so if you set this to uh, turn eight, it's going to have this event run at the start of turn one through turn eight. Like at the start of turn one, at the start of turn two, and so on and so forth until finally it reaches eight. Now you can set to when the uh, when this event happens even further by designating like what phase of the turn it should be on. Like for example, you can set it to run on the player turn at the, right before player turn or right before enemy phase. That's how you get ambush spawns. Or run it on the NPC turn, which you'll see in like um, one of the Fog of War chapters in FE7 when it makes Fiora show up. It runs her event where she shows up on the screen just in time for NPC phase to show up so that she can actually move. Uh, and that's more or less it for the turn events. Um, we're going to have to get into the nightmare that is conditional events later. Uh, honestly, I'm going to hate doing that, but whatever. Okay, so next up, we're going to talk about talk conditions. So, again, it's in the event conditions. This is the talk condition menu. Since there's none yet, we can make one by hitting extended list. We're only going to have one, so we just click that and then relocate data and point. So, talk condition, achievement flag. Well, we only want it to happen once because if you set this to zero, um, achievement flag zero is a flag that is always off so basically if you have two people talk it, no flag is going to be set and so they could just keep talking over and over again so you need to set this to some flag preferably one of the temporary flags like nine and you know what we're gonna make this between erica and what's his face i think it's o'neill yeah we're gonna make we're gonna have them talk uh, I, I don't know about this stuff. <laughs> if it's on... Oh, hey. Oh, okay. So basically, it's like... You can make it so that this talk conversation only happens after another flag has been set. But fuck it. We're not going to do that. So now all we need to do is just create the event where they talk. So, allocate new data. And we're just going to have a dumb talk conversation where Erica tries to recruit him onto his side or something. Uh, hold on a second. Okay. So we're just going to use that dialogue. But we're going to change it. Uh, fuck you, Fado. Open mid left. Load face. Uh, I think it's... That's how I load Erica. Irica. I don't know how to pronounce her name, man. I'm sorry. I know some people get really bugged about that. Alright, so we need to change this person to O'Neill. I don't know where he is. There he is. So it's number 30. Sometimes the simple editor is, is better to use. Uh, okay. So we want Erica to talk first. Just for convenience, I'll do that. Join me. Whoops. And then... O'Neill is gonna say... Whoops. There we go. No. <laughs> uh, beautiful. That's, that's, that's how I like it, man. So we're just gonna check to see if this actually works. Oh, I picked the wrong character again. That's odd that it does that. Hey, dude, what's up? I don't know why I made the background show up, but... Oh. Oh, yeah, that's right. Seth shows up and says all that's left is their leader. Um, yeah, I think it set some background... Oh, that's why. Background, yes, normal conversation, low. Okay, let me just... Let me just fix that. There we go. I think that's what makes it you know, do all that weird stuff. We're going to get rid of that dumb thing where Seth says all that's left is their leader, by the way. You know what? It's probably an always condition, actually, now that I think about it. 
Yeah, oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah, my bad. <laughs> Let's just get rid of this event entirely. Uh... Well, let's also add this in there just so that it doesn't remove the other event we did. You need to have something. that It can't just be all zeros or else it just assumes that there's nothing there. And there we go. There we go. It's all working now. <sighs> Shit. Where, where was I? Talk conditions. Yes. Uh, I think we pretty much did everything we need to do with that. Uh, if, if we want... I could have him say yes and then change him to join our side. Ooh, fancy. Let's, uh, let's, how about we make an event that makes him join our side? So, all right, so I changed the dialogue so that he says yes. Let's go to player affiliation, change to ally, and set it to his character number, which is O'Neill. And there we go. He's now an ally. He's now our friend. And I think that also ends the chapter because I set a condition to check if any enemies are on the screen. Wait, it didn't change him to an ally at all. <laughs> what the heck? Player. Oh, of course. That makes sense. All right. Either way, we got you get the idea. So that's how you would do like a recruitment conversation between two characters. We've done map objects for the most part. Yeah, more or less. Uh, you can also, ha you, do, you don't need to only do tile changes that are specifically like related to this stuff. You can also just have any random tile change on the map where like, oh, hey, maybe a river shows up here. And then you could trigger that map change to happen through the events uh i won't get too deeply into it that's for you to figure out baby always condition now uh i guess another thing you do you can do with always conditions is that you could set a range hold on let me just i'm basically touching over relatively superfluous stuff at this point uh you don't really need to know all this shit and you can probably figure it out on your own but Range condition. So, range upper left, range upper left. No, that's bottom right. That should be bottom right, 7743. So, basically, here I create a square. It, it range, basically, that's its range. Um, and if you step in that area, that will cause this event to play. Mm, let's just set it to some temporary shit. So, okay. An event... Yep, we're going to make a new event. So basically, I'm going to make an event that checks if you stepped in that area. Now, it's very important that you have a specific thing uh, at the start of your uh, range condition. I just need to find it. Whoever passes if you are in the army. So basically, this checks if... The person who stepped into uh, the range of these tiles, if they are one of your units. Um, we're just going to set this to 905. So basically, all this is is just if you step in this tile area, it runs a cutscene where a dialogue plays. We're just going to make it something simple. There we go. Bam. Change it. Sign it. And just to make sure that I got it right, we're going to see if the enemy can step in it. Also, you, uh, Erica was loaded in that area, but it doesn't check until you hit the wait command on it. Oh, he's not moving. Well, that complicates things. All right, either way, let's just step in the area. And it didn't work. And I did, in fact, step in that area. Uh-oh. That's not good. Well, time to check something. Okay, I figured out the issue. Okay, so remember how earlier when I had an always condition, I, I set the achievement flag to B, and everything else was just empty? <sighs> that fucked shit up. Basically, the game was looking 
only at the first always condition event and it was just skipping the others because it saw that this was empty and thought that was the end of the data. So now it I, I basically just put the always condition the range condition into this spot instead of here and now it works. Hooray. Okay, so uh, I guess while we're at it since we pretty much solved the issue uh, why is this here? Oh, that's right. There we go. Now it's gone. Okay, so I figured out how to remove the intro uh, of the game and a couple other things. So you go to patch and you go to you type in skip and there you go. You can skip that screen. Skip the intro cutscene if you so choose and you can even skip the new game text. So let's open up the ROM and look, it goes straight to there. And there we go. It just goes straight to that. So let's see. Yep. And it just goes to the world map event. Awesome. And if you want to remove the world map event because you don't want to deal with that shit. Um, I'll show you that in a second. Alright. So just so you guys know. Yes, it works. And there we go. Good. Um, skip the world map event. Okay. So let's say you don't want to deal with that shit. Oops, wrong editor. Chapter editor. So, the the world map event is somewhere around here. World map event is this. And so, basically, this is the first world map event. This is the prologue's world map event. Or rather, the ID that indicates where it is on the world map event table. And there you go. See? This is the fall of Renee's. And you can check. You, you can basically just edit it here. You can remove it by just removing all these events, all this world map event shit. Uh, I don't know what this is, but it doesn't matter. I'm sure. <laughs> uh, alternatively, you, you could just set this to zero. That's it. Um, okay, so now that we're done with the range condition um, and the always condition, ASM conditions are basically like uh, the game will run some ASM. Which will be shown in this event. Oh, here it is. Judgment ASM function. So basically, if you want to check for a specific ASM condition to be true. Like, oh, does Erica have this specific item in her inventory? You would create the ASM that checks for that. You would have the judgment ASM function just point to it. Uh, you would also have to... Yeah, a simple function is effective only when the return value is R0 equals equals one so r0 is sort of a uh asm variable basically um yeah so basically you would point to your asm event by putting its offset and then adding one to the end uh well yeah plus one essentially uh and then if that asm event returns true it'll execute this event right here i'm not gonna get into it because simply be i haven't messed with it enough um, tutorial events, nobody likes tutorials, so basically all I did was I took this first event and just put zero, and then that removed the entire table of tutorial events, so you don't have to deal with that. But if you wanted to make a tutorial, uh, good luck, because I don't think anybody's gonna help you. <laughs> um, trap, gorgon egg, damage floor, I haven't actually messed with this, but you know what, just for the heck of it, let's mess around. <laughs> gorgon egg, let's place it right here. Hatching starts uh, here, maybe, and its level is going to be 10. I have no idea what I'm doing. Good luck. Unable to write. Oh, oh, that's right. I, I, my bad. I forgot to expand the table. Okay, so. Gorgon egg. Hatching starts, and we're just going to put that just for funsies. I've not messed with this, so let's just see what it does. Well, nothing happened. So, that's not good. When the turn has elapsed, it will hatch from the egg at the emergence start time. You know what? I think what you're supposed to do is you're supposed to put a, load a Gorgon egg onto there, like, as an event. Or rather, as unit data, and then this Gorgon egg will do it. I don't know. I'm sure somebody will explain in the comments. Uh, a mine trap. Wow. I didn't even know that was a thing. 
You can also set fire traps, which that I know about. Um, a ballista. I believe this is just like you can place a ballista wherever you want. Uh, long ballista, killer ballista. And I don't know what this is, so I'm just going to leave it alone. And let's see what happens. There you go. You got ballista on your map. Um, yeah, I don't know too much about the trap, uh, events. Uh, player placement, this is just literally you go into the player, the unit placer, and, uh, so long as you load the unit data, it will happen. This is all convoluted, so I just decided to make my own and put in the chapter start event, so fuck it. Also, there's different player placement, if it's hard level, so that's worth looking at. Um, world map skirmishes. I have not messed with this either. Uh, but I assume it's monster event related. Really, I'm just trying to get you, teach you how to make a basic chapter. So none of this should really be, uh, anything to worry about. So I think that's about it, um, for making a basic, basic chapter. Um, I don't, I don't think there's anything, I mean, obviously I didn't go into too depth when making cutscenes. I feel like that's relatively intuitive enough that you can figure that on, out on your own, but if you guys want me to show you how to do it, I can. Uh, the only thing that would be an issue is conditional events. Ah, you know what? I guess I'll get into that then. All right, so. Okay, so I think I figured out what a good conditional event could be. All right, so. Let's make a conditional event that checks if you visit the village with O'Neill or somebody else. So, as you guys remember, um, I made it so that you could recruit O'Neill. I also changed my events a little so that the chapter doesn't end if you, you know, if all the enemies are gone. It just ends if you uh, seize. Uh, I did that off screen. Now... Currently, my village event is set to just give you the rune sword, and that's it. No matter who is visiting it. Now, let's say I wanted to make it change depending on who visited it. Alright, so... The way that conditional events work is a little, uh... Difficult to understand. But basically, you have here a bunch of conditions that you can use. So, let's see. Check active ID. So, active ID is the character that's currently acting so basically the person who visited visited the village so let's set that to o'neill um so next we got to so th that just checks what character it is it doesn't actually do anything yet um but now you want it to you know, branch if it returns, if, if like the character that visits is O'Neill. Basically, this is this is just returning true or false, whether the character that visited is O'Neill or not. So basically, you want to have like a branching event that branches if if like it's equal. And I think you gotta set this to C for some reason. I'm not sure. Um, I'm not entirely sure. I'm not too confident in my eventing, uh, my conditional events. I'm still relatively new to FE8 eventing, and I don't really use the conditional IDs very much. Um, so, we're going to set this conditional ID to one. You don't want any events to have the same conditional ID as other ones, unless it is a end condition event, uh, which is also very weird, because... Um, for some reason, the end if condition is label. So, set that to that. So, that's basically... Uh, right now, the event looks like this. Check character. If it is equal to the character specified here, as in, if it's O'Neill, then give a rune sword. And that's it. So, if I visited with Erica, it wouldn't give me anything. So, we need to set a condition where it's like, but if it's not O'Neill, let's uh, give them something else. So, I think what you want to do is you want to go to branch and then go to, which is also weird. But you want the go to condition to be before 
the label con the condition that ends the uh, this condition here. And you want to have a different ID. Um, and to end the go to condition, which is for all intents and purposes, or else, you know, there's if or else. Um, you want... Fuck, I lost my train of thought. Okay, so basically, in between the go to and its own ending condition, you want to put what happens if O'Neill is not the one entering. So we're just going to give you a different item. Give item to visited unit. We're going to give you, you know what, let's give you the repair. And for that matter, let's let's make the weapon that O'Neill gets something that makes a bit more sense. Like uh, Steel Ox, maybe. So this should work. Okay, so just to reiterate, because I know this is very confusing and I'm not wording myself well. Check active character. If it is O'Neill, if it is O'Neill, then get a Steel Axe. Or else, end this conditional and start with this. If it's not O'Neill, give a repair, end that conditional, and then end the event. Let's see if it works, all right? <laughs> all right, so Erica's going to visit. And she gets a repair. Good. Let's restart the chapter. Let's recruit O'Neill and have him visit instead. And there we go. So that's the gist of how conditional events work. So what else is there to cover? I don't think there's much else in terms of constructing a chapter. And a lot of the other stuff when it comes to editing is pretty self-explanatory. Like, oh, hey, here are her growth rates. Mark, how do I edit growth rates? Change these. How do I change Erica's base stats? Change these, but also keep in mind what class she is. Because it's going to add her character bases and her class bases together to get her actual bases in the game. Then your, there's your weapon level. As you can see, it's currently at E. If you set to zero, it's nothing. So that's E, 31 is D, and so on and so forth. Again, pretty self-explanatory. Then you can set their skills. Um, for example, Erica Lock. Um, basically, any items that are locked to Erica will be usable by a, the character that has this Erica Lock ability. Uh, same with Ephraim Lock, Lindis Lock. Wait, Lindis Lock? Um, Athos Lock? Okay. <laughs> Basically, these are different locks that you can use. Uh, oh, magic seal exists. I didn't even know that this skill is available only to enemies. Wow, that's kind of lame. Um, yeah, so as you can see, it's all pretty self-explanatory. Item editor. If you want to edit the graphics of stuff, um, that varies depending on what you're editing. Like, for example, if you're editing a portrait... What you want to do is you want to export the image. Uh, we're going to make that Erica. This is where Usenti comes in handy. Wait, did I? Oh, I... <laughs> Oops. Okay, so you, you expect export Erica. It's going to open up a new window for that crap. <laughs> and where do we go? We go to Usenti. You want to use Usenti specifically because uh, it's designed to edit graphics while still maintaining their proper palette in the game, as you can see over here. So there's Erica. Uh, you know what? Just because I feel like it, I'm going to put some some shades on her. I, I am not doing this particularly well, but don't mind me. All right, so you might also notice all the other shit that's going on on this screen, like... Wow, why is Erica's mouth just splayed all over this fucking place? Why are her eyes over here? And why is her TV here? Well, that's because this all um, abides to a formatting formula. So that's compatible in Game Boy Advance Fire Emblem. So here's the issue here. I gave her shades, but anytime she blinks in a cutscene, these are going to show up and her shades are going to mysteriously disappear. 
these are her blinking frames over here. So if you have these shades, you kind of have to put it over them. So there we go. And there we go. And there we go. And so, all right. So we gave Erica a pair of shades. We just save and then we can re-import this into the game. And bam, Eric is wearing some sexy shades. Check it. Whoa, she's she looks like she has two black holes in her eyes. <laughs> oh man, I'm so dumb. <laughs> so there's other graphics you can edit. You kind of just edit them in the same fashion. Like, for example, let's say you want to edit the Slim Sword. You want to go to that. You want to click this. And I think you want to export the image. Yep. Slim Sword. And then you do the same fashion. Uh, you don't mess with the palettes. Though you can if you want to. Uh, the game will accept that. Uh, and if you're making your own portraits, just be sure to follow the same format that this does. Like, hold on. I'm going to... I'm going to make sure I make this abundantly clear because, okay, so there are certain parts of the image that are not used by the game. This area up here is not used. I believe this uh, somewhere around here is unused and over here is unused. So if you put any graphics in those areas, uh, the game's not going to count it. So it's only like this area and uh, this area. That's the main portrait. Uh, also, you you have to have your portrait at a specific size. This is the size. This is the, these are the dimensions: one twenty eight by one twelve. And uh, when doing this in Ucenta, you definitely want these borders on because these squares will guide you on where you're allowed to draw. Like for example, uh, the mini portrait is a f four by four tiles essentially. Um. The blinking frames are 4x2 tiles, uh, and so on and so forth. This area is unused, and uh, I mean, it, it should be pretty self-explanatory. These are the smiling frames. These are the not smiling frames. Um, I believe what's used down here is whatever mouth is used here, because that's considered to be the normal facial expression. I'm not too sure on that, though. Um... So if you make your own portraits, you might also have to make your palette. Make sure that your palette is 16 colors with this first one being the transparent background color. Otherwise, it will, it will the background will display when you have your portrait up. Uh, anyway, back to the editing the item icon. No, I'm not going to save changes. Uh, item icons are very small. It's just 16 by 16 pixels. They... All weapon icons, and item icons for that matter, use this same palette. So these are the colors you're stuck with, just for good. Uh, unless you change it, but then you have to change... Uh, that changes the palette all across the board for every item. Um, but yeah, this is how you would do it. You would just draw whatever the fuck you want. And, and then you just reinsert it into the game, and that's how it would look. It would look like a Slim Sword that had some vomit poured on it. Um... Hmm. I don't think there's much else to cover, really. Whoops. I guess uh, when you're done, you're going to want to save. And there you go. And also, when you're done, you're going to want to save as UPS difference. So basically, you, go, you find the original ROM. Uh, that is unmodified. This is the one. You create the difference. Tutorial. Then you save, and then there you go. It creates the UPS patch. And there you go. If you have any further questions, please let me know. Because, um, as you can see, there's a lot of shit to cover. Some of it is self-explanatory, so I don't feel it needs to be covered. Um, other stuff, I guess, such as backgrounds is not as cut and dry and easy to figure out, but I don't think many people care. <laughs> so anyway, thank you all for watching. Marky Joe 1990 signing out.